So, first of all, you should introduce yourself and okay. tell us where we are. Sure. Uh, uh, my name is Nick Curtin. Uh, I'm the uh, co-chef and co-owner of Restaurant Alouette. Uh, we opened here in Eastland Spoiga uh, just over two years ago. We've had a good run. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much. Didn't expect a pandemic to interrupt the run. Yeah, well, you know, every day is a new day, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, in all the things going on in the world, uh, uh, I guess a pandemic is just like another yeah. day at the office. But in the middle of it, yeah. so mid March. You called me. Yes. Let's talk about that. Um, right. So we uh, we did our best to keep our whole staff on for as long as humanly possible. We we being in Denmark, we're on this like first class flight in terms of how countries have handled the pandemic. So right. uh, uh, the government came out pretty early and said that they were going to create a salary compensation, and that was great. But. Um, restaurant people by nature are restless individuals and uh, there are very few opportunities that we have um, to to educate beyond the day-to-day -day work that we have to do right mm -hmm. if you're a cook you come in you have your section and your responsibilities that's what your focus is on maybe every couple of weeks you learn a new dish with that might come a new technique or a new flavor that you haven't tried you experience new dishes ideally over the course of four seasons or more and then at some point you're like all right i've absorbed what i need to from this space so i move on mm -hmm. and that's your learning is uh, by doing yeah uh, and very rarely do we have the opportunity to um, uh, kind of step out of that workmanship context and, and uh, educate uh, on on bigger ideas or bigger right. concepts and uh, we were sitting there in the first week or so, and my wife was like, we, we, I think a couple of our, our cooks had stopped by to just check in, and a couple of our servers had stopped by to check in. And uh, we had asked each one of them what they're up to, and they were all like, well, okay, on day four, I was bored because on day three, I made 600 dumplings, and on day two, I, uh, I went to another restaurant and fixed all their uniforms. And like, they had very obviously burned through all of their the stuff. Like, they this, could do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, so my wife turned to me and she said, well, you know, we always talk about uh, wanting to educate people beyond their immediate responsibilities. Maybe this is the perfect time to do it. So maybe we should set up a, a, a course. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to the whole staff and I said, hey, uh, uh, Camilla had this idea. Uh, I think it's great. She thinks it's great. Uh, are you guys on board? And if so, what do you want to talk about? And the mm -hmm. two ideas that popped out were uh, people really wanted a um, a bit of understanding on how the financials of a restaurant work, uh, mm -hmm. how to build a budget and, and maintain it. Uh, and, uh, and then the other question was uh, leadership. How do we define leadership at Alouette? How do we ideally want to develop it? What does leadership mean? And uh, uh, we took that one in particular as an opportunity to call you. And instead of saying, uh, I'm Nick and this is what a leader is, turn it into a conversation of um, uh, what is a leader, uh, what are markers of leadership, how do we cultivate leadership, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, is what we do in our restaurant or even the industry at large, is that the right way of approaching uh, management and growth? Hang on. Ooh. Bring it over. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Holy fuck. Mm. I should have had that one first. <laughs> Didn't want to say the tomato worked? Having tomato. That's the tomato, yeah. 100%. It's the right salt level. 10%? 10%? What? It's not that much. It's... It's... <laughs> <laughs> so, what I was going to say is that there's an irony here, which is this. You say that it's an opportunity for you to step out and think about things in an abstract way. Yeah about finance and, account, finance and accounting and leadership. That's all we do at CBS. Right. And what we want is much more learning by doing. So it, it's almost a perfect match in some ways, right? I mean, you know, I, I think that um, these are just, these are very, 
you've got the academic approach and then you have sort of like restaurants have been viewed as blue collar work, right? Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. Uh, craft, where right. it's craft. Uh, I think that's yeah, better. Craft. Yeah. Um, uh, you spend time uh, focusing on the mastery of technique, and as you achieve certain levels, therefore you are moved up on the rungs. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of contrary to how uh, businesses overall or academia has come to understand what growth in a company should be or what leadership should be. Mm -hmm. And so something that you and I had discussed previously and something that kind of made me scratch my head was, all right, uh, restaurants are based on this apprenticeship model mm -hmm. that is 100 years old. Pre-modern. Pre-modern. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and really has not developed since Escoffier was like, we're going to create a brigade system mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. uh, that's going to be that. Uh, people have maybe flexed on that a bit, but we still use the same terminology. We still mm -hmm. use the same approach. And we're not identifying uh, leaders as much as really talented cooks or really talented servers, and mm -hmm. then saying, well, you've achieved, you know, like this skill unlocked, therefore next level. Yeah. And uh, one of the questions that, that that made me think about in, in terms of what we can do here, or maybe what we should assess to do at the rest, in the rest of the industry is, should we, should we maybe, uh, should we maybe, look at different ways to cultivate leaders in our industry. Mm -hmm. uh, should money be tied to uh, technical skill or should it be tied to leadership qualities or are there ways to motivate both? Right. Um, uh, could we learn a little bit more from, from academia or from uh, uh, you know, modern business structures and, and kind of try to grow our industry in a more stable way? right now it's not see but again the irony for me there is that it's not clear to me that it's not the other way around yeah that because because there's no model for doing leadership development in culinary context yeah nobody's done it much yes yeah. for the reasons you just mentioned it's it could be the opposite or maybe it's just both yeah. that we we academics we people who do leadership development could learn from what you guys do you yeah know what I mean I mean that's what's cool because it's I mean it's frankly intimidating as a business school professor to be asked by a chef to come in and talk to a kitchen because you guys have you already have you use the word craft i mean you're at a level of your craft that you know what i mean yeah i mean i think for us it's not clear that the that the conventional models apply in this context right and i know so the conversation is how to yeah translate i mean i think it is a two-way street one of the um interesting but also sometimes agonizing parts about trying to merge these two worlds is that we are people who look for answers yeah and academia is is uh, looks for questions i think mm -hmm. uh and that's a good way to put it yeah, yeah. and and so uh, in in our work we're always looking for this sense of finality like ah yes this is how we're supposed to do that or, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and from academia it's like okay um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what, right. what is a leader, really? That's right. And we're like, <laughs> what is tell this? us. You know? What is <laughs> this? Yeah. So, yeah, what is is, uh, what do we know? Uh, and, and, but, but that was also, it's also a really important thing for those two kind of mentalities to meet, yeah, right? Exactly. Because sometimes academia needs to come with answers to provide to people can't only be asking questions and sometimes people who are used to finality who are used to you do this this and this and this means this need to be put into a context where they have to ask themselves yeah. what does this mean and and why should i feel this way or what sh you know what are the things that 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 drive me or or what are the things that i look for out of myself or my colleagues and those are questions that that people who are who are, are presented their day to day, yeah. their entire careers, uh, aren't used to asking. But I gotta say, so we we literally just asked your staff yeah. that very academic question: What is leadership? Yeah, and the answers were pretty cool. I mean, they came back with eloquent statements about what their jobs were like and how leadership figured into that. So, I mean, you know, we first of all we have some really incredible 
people here. Like mm -hmm. We built mm -hmm. this team of, of people who we know are capable of abstract thought. It's a lot of what drives our business is abstraction, yeah. uh, particularly this restaurant. Uh, we are constantly uh, shifting and uh, changing the program. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a foundation, but we're not static in how we approach things. Yeah. And so we need people who are adaptable and, and capable of that abstraction. Yeah. And so when you uh, present any of the people that we have in this restaurant with questions like that and give them the time, often they'll come up with uh, uh, really compelling thoughts mm -hmm. on the subject. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we found that with, with this question as well. A lot of people had, um, you know, different ideas, but it was a really great springboard to kind of bounce off of, to say, okay, well, this is, this is what you thought about what leadership means, or, yeah. uh, or who, uh, what, a, what a leader is, uh, and, and I, I just felt like we had some really uh, provoking discussion. I don't feel like we necessarily reached a lot of uh, conclusions. No, that's because we're academics. Yeah. We don't, we don't conclude <laughs> No, but if we if we pursued as we pursue the partnership yeah. see, between CBS and yeah. the restaurant industry further, I mean we have to negotiate that balance between asking searching searching questions and um, and providing something of immediate value. You know what I mean? Well, I think in the short term we provoked thought. We provoked yeah. like yeah. first. Uh, they had to come up with ideas on their own, thoughts on their own on like, do are we doing things the right way? Is the industry doing things the right way? What, mm -hmm. what is it that I mm -hmm. need? Mm -hmm. uh, what do I want to become and, and in what context? And and those are those are questions that they may, maybe never would get asked. And so mm -hmm. being able to create that environment where, where that's kind of their only prerogative, uh, um, I think is a really valuable opportunity for yeah. them. And we came across some ideas that, you know, were threads that I think that if we keep to, keep pulling, yeah. we can yeah. unravel a, a great deal. I, we, you know, one thing that I think about a lot was um, we discussed we discussed this brigade model from Escoffier, but we also talked about okay, Escoffier a hundred years ago based a kitchen system on a military system. Mm -hmm. The military system has adapted and grown, right? Right. Like uh, now, it's uh, uh, you know Delta Force or SEAL Team Six that have uh, independence and uh, are able to work right, in right, collaborative right. methods, but without the same top-down uh, mm -hmm. management theory mm -hmm. uh, that that used to be applied. So uh, uh, military management has shifted, but. Uh, restaurant management has remained static. Yeah. But if, if we looked to that then, should we then also look to it now for, for new indicators on, on how we develop? Or is there perhaps another model that, that fits us better? Just getting those ideas going and being able to discuss them in an open forum uh, as, as, as colleagues and as people who are interested, uh, that was, um, yeah. I think that was enormous so, for us. so one of your responses to the crisis was to work with your employees on sort of both individual and team development. Yeah. But the other thing you were doing was talking to other restaurants, other chefs, and other restaurant owners. Yeah. And in those conversations, you were talking about how bad the situation might get for employees. Yeah. Right. I mean, so my big concern going into uh, into the pandemic and and you know the quarantine here but also seeing other countries start to shut down was that and we're seeing this now in the mm -hmm. numbers but mm -hmm. was that uh, independent restaurants and a business that had struggled to become healthier for its employees mm -hmm. all of a sudden would be put in a position where uh, there was massive unemployment huge demand for jobs yeah. and then a struggling industry which would then turn into into an opportunity to undercut these employees. Yeah, because there'd be, there'd be a massive unemployed, unemployed pool of people that yeah. you could pay poorly. Yeah, you could say, well, look, you know, I used to pay you, uh, uh, you know, $5,000 a month or $4,000 or I don't know, and mm -hmm. now I'm going to pay you half that because yeah, you I need can't. a job and yeah. I can't afford it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, and the the people who are usually going to push that front are, are 
bigger business, right? Because that's the economic model on which they're based. They're like, all right, let's make it more efficient. Let's make it cheaper so that we can produce more of it and mm -hmm. send out more of it. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas independent restaurants, you know, there's more one-to-one -one interaction with the employee. Uh, there's more interest in the individual welfare. Uh, but now we're seeing numbers coming out of the United States that say, what, 80% of uh, independent restaurants are going to close by 2022. Mm -hmm. So that sort of abstract threat is becoming much more real because yeah. as independent restaurants close, the, the uh, businesses that will swell and expand to take their place and thus do all the hiring are these big... Because they have uh, capital. They have they capital. Have, they, yeah, have, exactly. they have independent capital that comes mm -hmm. from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. They have stock. They have... Uh, you know, uh, they're publicly traded. Mm -hmm. So they, they have uh, resources that they can lean into that is not available to these smaller businesses. Mm -hmm. And then they get to go to their, to their investors and they get to say, guess what? Mm -hmm. Guys, we have no competition and everybody wants to work for us because there's nobody else. So we're going to pay them like dirt and we're going to charge less and mm -hmm. we're going to take over the world. Mm -hmm. So how do we prevent that? Yeah, so uh, uh, one thing is, is, in my mind, is that, that Independent restaurants need to work together to to create a more firm model for what we believe the future of independent restaurants or restaurant employment period should be. Yeah. If we're here offering mm -hmm. even higher paying jobs and saying, you know what, the value of food uh, has been Y in your perception, but in reality it's X, and X is 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 greater yeah, than Y, and so food, yeah. you know uh, mm -hmm. the the cost of your steak. Uh, you buy it super cheap, but what are the ramifications on the environment? We're buying this steak. You're going to get 100 grams. It's going to cost you more than you anticipate, but mm -hmm. it's something that's special and you should value that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when we bring you a piece of meat, it's not just that I've taken a piece of meat and put it on a flame and, and served it to you. There are a bunch of people who, right. who have gone into um, uh, bringing this to your plate. Mm -hmm. and that there's mm -hmm. value. So dining should maybe not be something that is, is viewed as a, ah, let's go grab some dinner, but as something that is an occasion. Right. Uh, and, and that's um, maybe what the pandemic has brought into light is that dining is a valuable and integral part of human culture. To be able to come together and um, uh, have that sense of camaraderie and celebration is something that throughout history has driven humanity and has been a necessity, right? We, we're not an essential, we're not essential workers in, in independent mid-range to fine dining restaurants because we're not there to supply people with sustenance, yeah, yeah. but we're essential in that we supply people with joy. Yeah. And, uh, and joy needs to be valued. Uh, if you have an overload of it, especially you devalue it, yeah, 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 yeah. You devalue it, and then it gets cheaper, and then all of a sudden it loses its resonance, and mm -hmm. then you create a business and are an industry that's over leveraged and undercapitalized, and can get the rug pulled out from it under in, under a moment. So, my belief mm -hmm. is that we need to, uh, as an industry, assess what it is that we we want not just for ourselves as businesses but what we want for our uh what we want for our co-workers and and our employees and our farmers yep. and say okay this is the goal that we're going to create we have to agree to pursue this and we have to to stop and nothing to get there mm -hmm. and if there's enough people doing it then a it can help save the businesses yeah. uh, because there's more revenue coming in in theory uh, and B, it will set the standard through which the larger industries need to follow. Mm -hmm. um, but if we don't do anything, then yeah. we'll kill ourselves. <laughs> That's... What you got there? This is the beef case. Ooh, ooh. You save the whole spoon. The whole spoon. Yeah. It's like you're giving him his message. Yeah. Take the whole it's spoon, like, Nick. It's, like <laughs> it's a little intense. Needs to be let out. Oh, this this for the meat itself. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's nice. <laughs> Have you ever had Boston baked beans? No. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Totally. This, is, this tastes like Boston baked beans. I make that. I make that exact <laughs> baked beans. You get it in a can. Mm. You just warm it up. <laughs> um. How can a partnership between the restaurant community and a business school like CBS help facilitate that conversation or find those things out about how to restructure the industry? I, 
I would say that one of the perils of the restaurant industry is that we're very closed off mm -hmm. uh, and very private about how we operate. Uh, the public doesn't necessarily know. There's not a lot of transparency from restaurant to restaurant. We don't necessarily know. You know, I can I can look at another restaurant in town and, and make predictions about how they run their business. You know, uh, what do I think that they spend on on payroll? What do I think that they spend on food? But I, I don't know. And if the guest doesn't know either, then who the the value, the determinant value is is so abstract that yeah. saying like this is what it should cost is just kind of a, you know, we're just feeling the wind, uh, and being able to create set change requires more than just putting our fingers in the air and mm -hmm, figuring out mm -hmm. which way the wind is blowing, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. We we have to maybe create more avenues of communication and and uh, create more research um, to, to make choices and choose directions that have evidence and empirical data right, right. behind them. Uh, and, and I mean, you've also used the word transparency before, right? I mean, a lot. Yeah. 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 I mean, the idea of a transparent restaurant was, you and Matt were talking about that. In when, uh, I remember reading a lot of uh, stuff coming out of the US when the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. And Eater, which is one of these food blogs, yeah. one woman basically put in a visual guide the entirety of her restaurant's accounts wow. out. Mm -hmm. as an article mm -hmm. to talk about like look this is what i spend my money on this is why you spend x amount on a falafel at my joint you know mm -hmm. uh, my employees have a profit share we talk with our employees about the these numbers um every so often mm -hmm. and to be able to see that was really moving mm -hmm. uh to to understand that people were sharing these in these things with their staff, getting them involved, yeah. to, to know that they were ready to talk about that openly and say like, hey, this is, you know, maybe you think this is cheap food, but like this is what it costs yeah. to, to get this to your plate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that was really important. And I think that restaurants have become this idea, there's this culture around restaurants that we're supposed to be a bad business. Mm -hmm. Right, like if we as a restaurant are uh, uh, profitable, or more specifically financially viable as a business, mm -hmm. uh, that somehow we're stealing from our guests. Yeah, that I mean that that is the conception mm -hmm. uh, that's that's put out there, and we have to figure out a way to break that conception. And if it only comes from the restaurant industry, it won't work yeah. because it'll sound like a bunch of people who are like. We need to make more money. You should give us more of your money. <laughs> Look the other way. Yeah, yeah. When you think, you know, oh, we're that. stealing from you, we're not. We promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, but every other industry is looking at margins that are 20 to 30 percent plus. Right. And our operating margins, a lot of restaurants are operating at below 5 percent, wow. which is wow. murder. Wow. Like, no business should be uh, mm -hmm. leveraged to that point where yeah, they're yeah, yeah. operating on 5 percent margins. Right. You can't create a liquidity bank right like if you want to look around and wonder why the entire industry is just getting eviscerated mm -hmm. it's because money comes in and it's already spent right like you've ordered in products that you're gonna pay for in two mm -hmm. weeks mm -hmm. you sell them to a guest they give you the money but you've already spent, spent that, that on the products yeah, that they're yeah, eating okay. mm -hmm. you know so if you've got a five percent margin you're not developing any cushion you're just struggling to pay yourself and there's to all sorts of lessons things. in that yeah, dynamic. That's amazing. It's tw I mean, it's twisted, but yeah. like it's become a cultural perception that this is how it should be. So how do we, how do we redirect that? Yeah. How do we say, in fact, no. Like in fact, this is a business where uh, there is so much volatility in yeah, terms yeah. of it's dependent on uh, on uh, labor and it's dependent on a. Uh, a product that has a very limited shelf life, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it it needs to have more cushion. Yeah. It's not like I have 2,000 units of something produced in China that can sit in an office somewhere and then whenever they get ordered, I send them out and all it requires is me to put it in a box and send it. Yeah. You know, yeah. like the margins on that are insane. Yeah. Drop shipping is a big deal because it's just a profit middleman business, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like you're taking one thing from one place, you're selling it to somebody else, 
that's it. You just skim money off the top, yeah. right? Whereas we've got to go find that product. We have to re, uh, restructure it. We have to have the people who, who do the restructuring. We have to have the people who uh, manage getting it to the the to our guests. We have to have manage. Uh, we have to have people who bring those guests in in the first place. There's so many facets to this yeah, business exactly. that if we don't have the cushion, then of course we're all going to die. Out. Um, to go back to the previous discussion for a minute. Yeah. What did your kitchen crew think about going back to school? In a in a schooly kind of way. And it, there was an added complication, which was, we did all that on Zoom. We did all yeah, that yeah. online, which was doubly weird. But I mean, I'm not really sure. I think hmm. I they really were engaged by it, and I would hmm. say that that's an indicator of them uh, appreciating it. Hmm. I would say that different individuals reacted in different ways. Uh, uh, Some people. A lot of the reason that a lot of us are in this industry in the first place is that we're not great at a classroom environment, yeah. right? And we're better with learning by doing, mm -hmm. and so that's how we like to approach things. I'm lucky enough to have had a university education, but did I value that education at the time? So where did you go again? I went to New York University, that's NYU, right. politics and philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Focus on game three, of all things. Um, uh, but I didn't really value that education at the uh, time because uh, the classroom environment was really static and there's a lot of uh, uh, dictation, right? Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. you go to a lecture and you're sitting among 500 other people. Yeah. There's somebody like telling you, all right, well, you know, this is uh, Nash equilibrium. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the prisoner's dilemma and walking you through it. And at some point, if you're a certain personality type, which many of us are. Mm -hmm. um, but in the sense of being in an environment where we can discuss ideas, where their uh, input is just as valuable as, as what's being said by people who are right. like leading the discussion right. and creating it as a discussion more than a dictation, mm -hmm. that keeps them engaged and creates something that that they can not only learn from, but create their own thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and so I think that they really enjoyed that. And they've been asking about you and asking about like how you're a, doing I, and when they're going to yeah. see you. So, you know, this is here. But I, here I love the idea of taking the two halves of, that is university-based business education and learning by doing and craft in the kitchen and putting together and seeing how you can make new kinds of education. That's what, that's what was really cool about it. We discussed this a little bit, which was, you know, we have students right now uh, in the educational system who the focus is really placed on the technical aspects of the job, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the um, a lot of the focus in the Danish educational system is getting an apprenticeship right. and then uh, uh, building up your technical set through that apprenticeship. And you know, some restaurants and some parts of the school do that really well, some don't, that's not really up for de debate. But what I feel like misses is that we have a lot of people who are still not really taught the practical aspects of running the business. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. understanding, I mean, I've been doing this for two years and I'm blessed to have, you know, all this background knowledge and having operated other businesses, yeah. understanding capital structure, understanding um, uh, contract negotiations, uh, leasing, uh, understanding uh, just a budget period. Those are things that nobody has ever but also to me or or even worked with me on. Yeah. It's just like... But there's also the other side, which is it. not um, trying out a vocabulary for discussing team dynamics. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Talking about leadership. Yeah. Talking about the way that we're... Talk about the restaurant as an organization. Yeah, you know what I mean, that's also that's cool. It's, I mean, it's different. But like, if if we want to improve as an industry, mm -hmm. we have to start looking more to the outside to yeah. to uh, find avenues for abstract thought. Yeah. On on you know, instead of just so much of what we do because it's an apprenticeship model, it's about the past being handed forward. Mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, Maybe mm -hmm. we come up with a new way to, to approach a piece of cauliflower or, uh, uh, you know, combine a couple of ingredients or, or whatever. But 
but we're doing it with uh, the knowledge of the past pushing us into the future. Mm -hmm. but, but we're not always looking ahead and saying, okay, but okay, how are we going to do this in five yeah, years? Or, yeah, or what yeah. does this mean? Or, or um, uh, sometimes we're just creating things because they taste good. But, but how do we how do we mm -hmm. make decisions creatively based on on uh, a broader vision? Yeah, a broader, broader vision. vision. Yeah, exactly. We we try to do mm -hmm. that here. Is it mm -hmm. a lot of how we run our business and a lot of what we put on the plate is about economic and cultural ideas that mm -hmm. we, we used mm -hmm. as the basis for building this restaurant. Very the cool. kind of life we wanted our, our, our staff to lead, mm -hmm. uh, the, the kind of uh, prices that we wanted to be able to charge, the mm -hmm. number of guests that we wanted to do, the experience that we wanted to do. Those are all uh, sort of abstract ideas that become physical when applied to an economic right. So they're uh, rooted in a thought process about what you want. Uh, yeah, it's cool. So, uh, but how do we how do we make more of that how yeah. do we allow people to start businesses or or alter their businesses with those ideas in mind mm -hmm. and then being able to take the very abstract and, and apply it to something more concrete hmm. how do we even get those questions going yeah. in your heads yeah. you know instead of just like yeah oh, i want to make tacos <laughs> you know like that's <laughs> That's great. You make a great taco, go make tacos. But like, how are you going to make that into a business? Right. You know, anybody, many people can make tacos. And uh, what is that business going to mean for both the people who work in it and for other people? Exactly. 